It is good to be with you. My name is Pastor Greg Delaney, as she mentioned, and we're going to talk a little bit today about the role of faith and spirituality in recovery resilience, and we're talking about recovery from substance use and mental illness. So we're in that space of addiction recovery uh, that we're going to kind of talk about today. And so um, I really liked this. We were kind of talking about thirsting. I, I, of course, was kind of pulled and drawn to Psalm 42. And that passage is so familiar, right? Is the deer panteth for water. You know, that's how our souls should long after the Father. And, and as a person who is in long-term recovery, I've been in long-term recovery for 16 years from alcohol use disorder. I was a person who grew up in the church. I'll fill you in a little bit more on that in just a second. Um, it was the journey within a spiritual construct in my recovery that I found my purpose. And while there were a lot of other pathways and a lot of other things that bolted onto that journey, it was my reconnection to the Father that was so critical. And so in this session, we're gonna kind of talk a little bit about just a little bit of how the science and the sacred kind of collide here. And that there's a place where we can navigate and have both as we're helping those around us uh, navigate the challenge of addiction recovery. Um, I have a song that I want to play for you. I'm going to have to hop out of the PowerPoint and play it, then hop back in. We have a little technical challenge, so you won't get to see the lyrics, but I want you to pay close attention to the lyrics. This was written by a guy named Joseph Habedank. Joseph is also a person in long-term recovery from opioid use disorder, but he was a part of a gospel group, southern gospel group, called the Perrys, and he was actively in that space during his addiction. And as he came out, he found some of his spiritual resiliency in places that we might say are the traditional idea of recovery. So in this kind of talk and staying in this idea about pouring water on the thirsty, one of the things that sometimes gets lost is we sit there and think that the spiritual aspect of substance use recovery is over here, the scientific piece is over there. And what's interesting is our folks at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, SAMHSA, who kind of sets the policy and research and kind of sets the agenda for us going forward as a country when it comes to uh, mental health and comes to substance use. They're saying research demonstrates that spirituality and religion positively help, is part, is positively impacts health and wellness. And so in that community, they're sitting there so, showing and, and, and understanding the value of that spiritual componentry to someone's recovery. And, they say it again in a different way here. They highlight the spirituality provides a sense of purpose and connection and meaning that strengthens an individual's resolve to overcome addiction. And so what happens sometimes in my situation is that, you know, in this journey that I've been on, I will have folks that will diagnose or they'll say that substance use disorder is a body-mind, it's a spirit thing sometimes, but they'll also say it's a biopsychosocial thing, and they'll leave that spiritual piece out of it. And when I have conversation with those folks, it, it kind of is like the idea of I have a three-legged stool, but if I had a four-legged stool, how much more stable is that stool with that additional leg? And so leaning into and, and what Samson is saying, we're going to go on this journey and justification and juxtaposition of where spirituality does have not just a positive but a life-changing impact on someone's recovery resiliency. And I think it's not just in the case of overcoming or finding sobriety or finding abstinence from drug use, but it really is in this idea that I'm building out an incredible foundation that is resilient in its recovery, resilient in, against the storms that are likely to come in the life of someone who's doing that. The other thing in Georgetown studies have shown that spirituality and religion can play a role on how an individual or adult or child copes with being sick. And the reason I really like this piece and this little bit of definition and this little bit of research is that the more that we understand what substance use disorder is, the more that we understand it as an illness, the more that we understand it's a chronic relapsing brain disease, the more that we kind of see what it's doing to the brain, the more we understand how it kind of hangs out in the amygdala hippocampus, how it hangs out in the survival center of our brain, then this really kind of correlates to me. It says that Spirituality and, re and, and religion play a role with how I'm being sick. How do I cope with that? And so, again, a place where you wouldn't kind of expect the validation to come from, Samsha or Georgetown, but they're seeing that it makes a difference, and it's making a difference in the scientific community in a way that we've known in the sacred community for a really long time. And so the reason SpongeBob's up here about 16 years ago, that's what I looked like. I weighed about 150 pounds, I was bright yellow, and I was dying from alcohol use disorder. Um, it had been a long journey of about 18 years. 
Um, I had grown up in the church. There are pictures of me in my mother's belly singing in the choir in church. And so the journey of alcohol use disorder and being a part of that community was never kind of in the cards when I first started. I was a son of an elder. I was a deacon in the church. I led worship. But the path of addiction took me to a place that I didn't expect to go on a journey that was completely unexpected for me and brought me to kind of a tipping point in 2008 where my bilirubin was so high, that's what color I was, <coughs> and my liver was failing. And coming out of that, once the doctors kind of figured out what was going on, and I have this amazing wife uh, who's here, she's going to be presenting at 2.30, um, she hung in there with me, she, she was uh, a rock through all of it, we've been together 42 years, and um, she was kind of met with this decision because she was the palliative care leader at the hospital that I was in when I was going to die. And I had taken her through bankruptcy and taken her through all the consequences that go along with addiction. And when she was posed the question, we think we should resuscitate him at least once, her response to that was, Lord, he is tormented by this illness. I know he knows you. I'll be fine without him. But if you leave him here, will you please heal him? And I woke up three days later with a, pa a pastor from a completely different denomination, a pastor had zero respect for because he cheated at golf. He was notorious in our community. And I'd grown up in the Church of Christ and he was a Pentecostal. And he sat across from me in my room and I had been addicted for a really long time and the church was so far in the rearview mirror to me. Religion was so far in the rearview mirror to me. Spirituality was so far in the rearview mirror to me. And he sat across from me after about three days of recovery from all of the the stuff that was going on physically with me. And he looked at me and he said, the Lord has told me that you're going to be my recovery pastor. And I'm like, bro, you're out of your mind. I'm a drunk. There's no way that's going to happen. And it can't happen in your church. There's no way I'd come over down your street, be in your building. And yet, you know, he was faithful to that because he had been on the journey himself 10 years prior. And so that began what I now have as a call on my life, and that is to help equip churches because way, the way I felt inside the church, the church that I grew up in, the church that I was in, in my mom's belly, as I was dealing with my alcohol use disorder, was the scariest, most horrible, most shameful place for me. I suddenly didn't belong. It felt weird. And I didn't think that they understood me. And I never felt really loved there. It was interesting, about a year after being in recovery, I went back to my home church and kind of shared my story of recovery. And I had countless people walk up to me and say, we knew you were jacked up. We knew you were a mess. We had no idea what to do to help you. And that has sent about 15 years now, if that's what I do. I, I look to try to help those people inside a congregation better understand what it is that I'm dealing with on that journey. And so when that happened and with that casting of vision from that pastor in a spiritual construct wasn't familiar to me, in a denomination that wasn't familiar to me, he was running a non-denominational gathering in Xenia that was very different than what I grew up in, but he opened the door for me to have a different kind of relationship, both vertically and horizontally, because he cast something different for me. And he showed me that there was value in the spiritual componentry of my recovery. And that's where I spent a lot of my time early in my recovery journey. It was in faith-based recovery settings. But then I began to realize that there was more to this out there. There were folks that were running treatment centers, and there were clinics, and there were things like CCHF folks. And so I took it upon myself to go work for a standard secular-based addiction treatment center, and I'm there now. We have 240 people in our house this morning uh, that we're handling with medical withdrawal and PHP and IOP and all of those really good things that are in the parlance of substance use treatment, right? But at the same time, inside there, not wanting to sacrifice all that the faith-based community and what my spiritual journey had given me, but how do I bring that into alignment with what I know to be best practice? And what do I know from my folks and friends at SAMHSA? And what do I know now as a part of something for Governor DeWine in Ohio called Recovery Ohio, which I'm a part? And so that was part of the journey. So that's how I got here today, is to having this conversation. It's over 15 years of experience of navigating both sides of this fence, if you will, both sides of this road, realizing that they're converging. And as they converge, which they've converged forever in AA, by the way, but as they converge, how do we begin to help 
see the value of each other. And so how do we help the value of spirituality be communicated and articulated to the folks in the science community and then vice versa? How do I help those that are in the faith-based construct realize there's value in medication for substance use disorder? There's value in 12-step programming. There's value in exercise. There's value in nutrition. There's value in getting more water. There's value in getting sleep. And there's value in having a relationship with whatever higher power, but in our case, in Jesus Christ, right? How do I have that both and happen? And so when you kind of take a look at substance use, as I mentioned before, I love looking at it with the four dimensions. It has a biological, a psychological, a social, and a spiritual dimension. And so with all of those in play, when we, when we address those with someone with a substance use disorder, when they come into the sphere of our care, recognizing that we need to address all of that. And there are different timings for some of it, depending on where that person might be in their journey. They come in, you know, pretty heavily addicted to an opioid. We know that we got to kind of settle the brain. We got to take a minute. We're going to have to make some biological kinds of decisions, some biological kinds of interventions, because really we can't even do a psychological intervention until their brain kind of settles down and they can have a conversation with us, right? And then suddenly we realize that addiction is a disease of isolation. It presses people into the shadows. It presses people into the shame. When I was at the height of my addiction, I lived in the, my parents' basement, laying on a couch, not to be gross, soaked in my own urine, alone. And so how do I reestablish a social construct? My social construct was over here that was feeding my addiction. How do I come up with a new one? But I'm not really ready for a new one because the mindset is no one wants me. I don't belong anywhere. There's only shame in my life. How in the world do I connect? And so it takes a minute before maybe I come over and handle that social dimension. And then if I'm really heavily addicted, me having a conversation with somebody who is actively high on any kind of substance, altruistically having something about Jesus, it's kind of a burnt cycle, right? They're not getting it. Now, on the other side of it, I have to be careful because I have seen people delivered from addiction. That guy that came to my, ho my hospital room, that guy that intervened with me, he went to bed one night, the night before, he was on a, a pattern of drinking a case of beer every day. He goes to bed one night, and his wife had been praying so much for him that she had worn the carpet out around their bed. He went to bed one night, goes to sleep, has a dream about cookies, no idea what it meant. He ends up having this Jacob kind of moment with the Lord, he's fighting with the Lord. Wakes up the next day, goes into work, and at work is where he got his beer. He owned a car wash. <coughs> so he would just drink all day at, at work. And the guy that went and bought his beer came up to him and said, hey, boss, you want to go down and get your beer? He said, not today. Never drank again. But for others, it's process. So again, it's kind of keeping the funnel open. How do we address it more holistically? Because if we do, our outcomes will certainly be better. Because I like what Dr. Maldi says about this. He says, addiction often originates in a human being's desperate attempt to solve a problem. Emotional pain, stress, connection, you can read it there. And often the question is not why the addiction, but why the pain. And one of the things that brings spiritual componentry to it that is so powerful is that that is where God hangs out. He is near to what? The brokenhearted. He comes alongside us in our pain. And so if we're carrying that as ambassadors of care, whatever setting that we're in, and that's part of our Holy Spirit makeup, we can bring that hope that we can kind of come and hang out in the pain, regardless what the whatever is. Whether the whatever is cocaine, whether the whatever is methamphetamine, whether the whatever is alcohol, whether the whatever is gambling, whether the whatever is pornography, whether the whatever is food, I can come into that space of pain from that spiritual place of equipping and maybe have a different discerning to help with all of those things, connection, social, stress, psychological, my physical issues that have already manifested because I'm dependent on the substance that I'm using. Does that make sense? Can faith and spirituality help? Kelly Mosell, who's a dear friend, he's in Atlanta. He kind of oversees uh, most of Georgia's faith-based addiction stuff is the best way I can say it. They have the craziest acronym for their group. It's like abracadabra. I can't make that up. It's nuts. But Kelly made this statement a couple years ago in a conference that he and I were doing about intervention and recovery is a holistic process. And so do we have a role as faith-based communities to minister? Absolutely. 
because we can provide the caring community, social. We can be there to help foster acceptance and forgiveness, supporting spiritual healing and growth. So we have a place to play. We've always had a place to play. But how do we take our place in that circle of a holistic approach? And then SAMHSA again, recently, in 2022, helps others realize they're never alone. Alcoholism, drug addiction, disease of isolation. I'm not alone. Peers, mentors, and professionals are always available. Faith asks people to, or allows people to ask for help, accept help, and foster forgiveness. One of the most difficult things in my life and in my journey, the culture that I grew up in, my parents are some of the most loving people on the planet, but they had grown up in a culture that you don't talk about your stuff when you go to church. And you most certainly don't ask for help. And don't you dare ask for help if I'm there at the same time. Not a bad thing. My daddy lives with me. He's 88 years old. He's a great dude. He was in ministry for 65 years. But that's how he was brought up. And so the idea of trying to navigate that when I desperately needed help and I was being told, man, your faith is hey, really, no, don't ask for it here. Not because you don't need it, but because I don't want to be labeled with it. And he and I, since then, there's been such a wonderful healing and holding, you know, holistic process with us. But that was part of the journey for me. Because here's what recovery is, and sometimes we need to define it because we're often trying to help somebody find it. And we have to realize that they have to kind of find it themselves. They have to find it in their own construct, in their own context. And, but SAMHSA does a good job of kind of defining it rather kind of largely with 12 different pieces. But I think when we look at it from a spiritual perspective, we see some things that sound spiritual in this, right? That recovery is a personal recognition for the need and change and change for change and transformation. If you go to church on a Sunday and your pastor kind of ends with that invitation, I think he might say that every Sunday. You want to come down and find that path of change and transformation. It provides the process of healing and self-redefinition. <clears throat> I'm not having this conversation with you all in 20, 2006. I'm not. I'm not even able. And so recovery has brought that. And so one of the things that we've learned is that when we can have these four components of health, home, community, and purpose, and those last two really fit nicely into the role of spirituality in creating a recovery that is resilient, a recovery that can withstand some of the storms that will likely come, the triggers that come, the traumas that come back, the, the things that we're not expecting. And I'll give you a couple examples of that. So that's the journey, and that's why this is so important to me and why I'm very passionate about it. So whether the setting is faith-based like we're here today, or we flip it around and the setting is clinicians, or we flip it around and we're having conversation with social workers, the journey for me is the same. It's trying to bring all of us to the table with our incredible acumen and our gifting to be able to surround a person with what it is that they need in order for them to be successful. And in order for them to be successful, spirituality must be a part of it. I have a dear friend, she lives in uh, New Jersey. She's a part of Seton Hall's staff. Her name's Keaton Douglas. And Keaton has the most interesting story. She was, when Guy Lombardo passed away, she ended up being the front singer for his band in Vegas. And she's got this really wild, you know, path of life. But there was a moment in time in her own journey, being in that culture, that she realized that she was looking for something more. And so she went and got completely uh, certified and, and finished in the Catholic faith, uh, divinity degree and everything. And then she wrote something called the I Thirst Initiative. And it really is all around this idea of where am I in, as a person of Catholic faith? Where do I find the juxtaposition? The, the, where do I put the, the two pieces together, the justification of how does my Catholic faith and my journey of recovery, how do they kind of coexist, but they also cooperate to help build recovery resilience in me? And Keaton is a, is a fascinating person. And so there are five things that I think come out of this that create recovery resilience that are spiritual in their nature. And the first one is this. Spirituality promotes purposeful pursuit. And what do I mean by that? When someone is dealing in, in the throes of a substance use disorder, purpose is out the window. Because my purpose every day is to make sure I feed my addiction. Because my addiction is telling me everything, it's running the show. It is marshalling me around by the nose. And so when I come out of that and I start to find recovery, for the early part of things, I will find recovery and I'll find some purpose in the fellowships. I'll find the purpose in the 12-step. I might find purpose in church. I might find purpose other places. But it's critical that I find 
the purpose piece. And often I will find that in acts of service. I will find that in acts of spirituality. I'll find it in all kinds of ways. I'll give you an example. I was a retreat master for something called the Matt Talbot Experience. Matt Talbot is a, the venerable Matt Talbot. They're trying to make him a saint, but he's a part of the AA kind of vernacular and community. And uh, he was a guy that was, uh, had a long history of alcohol use, came out of that alcohol use and found his journey of recovery. As he found it, he found a life of service. And so the Alcoholic Anonymous community have kind of embraced him as kind of a, not poster child, but an example of someone on a spiritual journey that found sobriety well before Bill and Bob figured out how to write the AA book, right? And so we're having a retreat, and it's a gathering of folks to really kind of lean into what is the spiritual piece of my journey. And what was fascinating is I, as retreat master, I had this chance to sit down with guys, and they came in, and they had a few minutes, and I had one fellow come in, and he power washes me with his story. And it is brutal. Parents, biological parents, abandon him, send him to foster care because he was one of 10. And he and his brother were just too many. So they sent him to foster care. He's in the foster care system. Before he's 10 years old, he's been in 12 houses. At the age of eight, Children's Services comes to separate he and his brother, and he beats the Children's Services representative with a ball bat to keep him off of his brother. Children's Services at that point in time, it's the late 60s, early 70s, comes in, and there are two different classes in school, and while the one boy is in class over here, they take him from his brother over here. Leads to a long history of trying to navigate his pain, and so where did he go? His pain took him to substances, and his pain took him to crack cocaine and to alcohol. And he fueled that from the time he was 14 till he was 18, until he got justice involved and justice said, look, you can either go in the army or you can go to jail. So he goes to the army, not the best culture for an al somebody with alcohol use disorder, goes to the army, does his trick, but continues to fuel it. Comes out of the army, comes back home. His very first line of work that he wanted to do was drive back to his biological parents' neighborhood and kill them. So he tells me the story of driving where he was. He's from Northeast Ohio. He drives in. He finds a convenience store, and he goes in. He says, do you know where this family lives? They happen to know where the family lives, and they said, man, you look just like them. And he goes to the house, and he knocks on the door, and when the door opens, he sees how pained his mom and dad are because they are in the throes of their alcohol use disorder at an incredible level, and he has pity on them, and he gets in the car, and he goes home. And when he gets home, he finds AA. He's in the AA community for 10 years, and he's sitting here telling me, and then after he gets done, he's like, I do the steps, and I, I sponsor people, and I have this other thing, but I don't know what my purpose is. And his name's Donnie, and I said, Donnie, what if I told you I could help you? What would it look like if you wanted to go talk to foster kids? Kids that are in the system, kids that have, are experiencing what you experience. What if we took you on a path of training you in order to do that? Do you think that was something at his, he just begins to weep. He's like, you can do that? I said, it's not me. I said, we'll connect you to somebody that can do that. And suddenly he's on this journey now at 60 years old of learning how to be a communicator back into a space he never thought he could do. And he has found his encouragement and he has found his cheerleaders inside his community of faith that are helping him find that purpose. And so spirituality in that space, finding renewed purpose, it, it takes us on positive action. Accountability, it accepts, it creates alignment for us. The spiritual community, the faith community, on that journey of resilience, I need to have accountability. I need to have someone that's gonna walk alongside me. And so in that social construct of recovery, that piece of community, my spiritual family, my spiritual team, the fact that I'm not alone, so suddenly I have a new accountability. I have a vertical accountability and I have a horizontal accountability, right? And so in that vertical accountability to this higher power, to the Lord, I'm, I'm in alignment to say that's an extra piece of resilience. That's one extra piece on the, on the, on the, on the teeter-totter of my resilience that keeps me steady in my recovery because now I have a new level of accountability. And it's not accountability that's oppressive. It's accountability that's loving me and restoring me and bringing me back in ways that I didn't think I could do because he's also surrounding me with people who have a similar accountability. And now we're accountable to 
to one another. And so in that creates resilience. In that allows me to have a thought prior to perhaps going back to the life that I have given up on behalf of recovery. It cultivates a community connection. That's pretty easy to see. When we are in our spheres of faith, and especially when we are in spheres of faith that have an understanding of who we are and what we have walked through. The peer community and the faith community, got a great work that's happening in Alabama where they took the peer support model, wrapped it with a faith wrapper, put it together, and are out teaching folks within the faith community how to be effective peer supporters. The science piece, connected to the faith piece. And so communities of faith-based, peer-led people are popping up all over the place. And in those small circles, in those spaces of accountability, in that community, suddenly I seem more emboldened. I have a different perspective about my recovery. Suddenly I'm moving from I can't do this thing anymore to I choose not to because I have purpose, because I have accountability because now I have a group that, that are connected to me that have similar views, similar pieces, they're spiritual people as well, and in that, that's creating resilience. I love what Brene Brown says about this, the irreducible love, need of love and belonging is irreducible to of all people. We're biologically, cognitively, physically, and spiritually wired to love, to be loved, and to belong. But when those things aren't met, what happens? We break fall apart, we numb, I like the bottom there, we get sick. And so why does that connectivity bring about recovery resilience? It's because it takes care of this irreducible need. It brings about the linkage that I need to help me to avoid those things of breaking and failing and falling apart and being numb or sick. Early on in, in the journey that I mentioned to you about my recovery, what was fascinating is that in that, as that community built, the Lord brought me people that I would have never connected to in my previous life, ever. And now they have become my dearest and richest and most amazing friends. That pastor that came to my hospital room, I didn't consider him a friend, and yet he is one of my best friends. He is in my community of connectivity. And when I think about any time where my recovery feels a little bit wobbly or I feel a little bit down or I feel a little bit at risk, I can think about Mark Brooks. I can think about my community. I can reach out and make that phone call and that adds to my resilience. Spiritual, spirituality fosters empathy, compassion, and humility. It changes our character. It was interesting, on Tuesday of this week, we have a social emotional learning platform we're gonna talk about here in a second called Good Life that we do in the state of Ohio. So we're in about 45 schools teaching about freedom, focus, future, and our friends. And in that social emotional learning platform, it's all about building resilience. And you're gonna hear me talk a little bit about it in greater detail in a second. But in that resilience piece, and so we're with 600 freshmen in high school. And there's some things that are funny, I'm 60, there's there's things that are, are eternal in junior high school, right? There's this click, there's this click, there's this guy, there's this guy. But what was interesting to me was when I was in school, if you were to be bullied, it happened once. It was an event. Or if something happened where you were embarrassed on the playground or embarrassed in class, it was a moment in time. While we were having a, an assembly, we were with these kids all day, while we were having an assembly with them, in some of our small group time, there were kids that were picking on other kids, but they were filming it for kids in the other room. It was in the ether. It was something very different. And so as we're talking about developing character in our recovery space, and as we build recovery resilience, we have to realize that there's a certain integrous part to it. And how do I begin to cultivate character? How do I begin to be seen differently? And it comes in building trust in my relationships. It becomes in being reliable and showing up. It, and all of those things lend itself to suddenly enriching my community because I'm someone that can be depended on. That somewhere in there, I have a different character, seen differently. Not in a haughty way, but seen differently 
than what I was before. Chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in a wardrobe God picked out for you, compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, and discipline. As we're looking for resiliency in our recovery and we're asking you to lean into that spiritual piece of that four-tiered model, we're saying those are the things that I lean into. That's how I get dressed every morning. Those are the things that I put in. And then what do I think about? Think about things that are reputable, things that love, things that don't cause strife, right? I, I change the way I do that. All of that sits around and creates a caring character. And what's been fascinating to watch is people that have kind of gone on this journey of resilience in their spirituality, in their recovery, they become some of the most amazing, compassionate ambassadors, not just for the Father, but for the community that around them that's hurting. Because suddenly they've seen that as almost missional. How do I give away what I had? That's a 12-step thing. But how do I also offer and bring compassion and care into my community? And what's fascinating is as you do that, it's a, it's a Luke 6 thing. Give, and it'll be given back to you. It's not just money. Give, and it'll be given back to you, pressed down, shaken. First Peter says it this way. It says, it's kind of my job to bless. And in that, I will receive blessing. I don't do it to get. I do it, and the byproduct is that. That all comes into my character building as I change the way I think, change the way I act on this spiritual path. The final one is, it makes mindfulness matter. When I have a path, a vertical place to engage with something bigger than myself, and in that time of prayer, in that time of worship, in that time of, of spending my moments with the Father, my mindfulness to that suddenly has more heft. There's more to it. It builds me in a different, resilient way. Because again, I go back. Addiction is the disease of isolation. With my mindfulness, I'm suddenly creating an instant connection and I'm no longer alone. So regardless of what's happening around me in my horizontal space, in my mindfulness, I'm building resilience because I'm having an ongoing, two-way, active conversation with the Father. And that builds resilience. Resilience for the time when it gets weird. And for all of us in life, we sometimes sit there and think, I know in early in my recovery, you know, there were moments, I, I was about a year removed from my alcohol use disorder, and we were doing ministry, and we decided we had a group of guys, and they wanted to go to a Dayton Dragons game, a, a bat, you know, baseball game. And I'd been to Dragons games when I was active in my addiction. And so I drank at the, at the Dayton Dragons game. That was just part of it. And got to the Dayton Dragons game and go into the gate. And for some reason, I didn't see any other vendor. I didn't see the popcorn guy, didn't see the hot dog guy, didn't see the ice cream dip and dot guy. To me, everybody was selling liquor. Everybody was selling beer. And yet, my accountable community, things had changed. My mindfulness had changed. So suddenly, that which was tempting, suddenly didn't have the control over me it might have had a year before. And that was the resilience that was built. My very first time, I, I traveled all over the world in, in my previous life. I was an international marketing guy. And during my time of addiction, I was the guy, the sad guy, at the airport that was sitting at the end of the bar at Applebee's at 9 o'clock in the morning, drinking. And so this new role, we start to go around and we're teaching this recovery friendliness thing. And I'm in the airport for the first time sober. And it was weird. I was there two hours early. And I used to get there two hours early just so that I could get shot for a dollar more. Absolutely. And now I'm sitting and it's like it's talking to me. Can't make it up. You know you need to be in here. You, you even got a chair in this one. You've been in this airport so much, they know you by name. And yet, resilience said, no, I'm going to go sit over here. Mindfulness, accountability, my character, those things in my purpose, those kind of things help to bring that back. Best my filling your mind, as I mentioned, with those kinds of things in my mindfulness. And so does this spirituality have a component with other folks that are doing what we're talking about here in this conference in terms of our clinical care? Absolutely. 
because all five of those things bring about resilience. And so I mentioned to you <coughs> that one of the things that we have the wonderful blessing of doing in Ohio is, is providing a social emotional learning platform for 7th, 8th, ninth, and 10th graders in Ohio. We also do it in South Carolina, North Carolina, and we're getting ready to do it in Las Vegas. And one of the things that we track for kids on the other end, if you look at addiction, there is in the addiction space or the recovery space, there's prevention, early intervention, treatment, and recovery. And so over here in the prevention space, one of the things that we're working to do is teach resilience. Resilience and knowledge for young people on making better choices. And so all the way over here in the prevention space and all the way over here in the recovery space, resilience is super, super important. And what's fascinating is I was preparing for this, I started to look at what we're doing over here in prevention, trying to educate folks early, and it lines up exactly what recovery resilience looks like at the end. And if you don't think so, when we talk about social emotional learning, it's built around self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and decision making. And if you look at those five things that I've just given you on spirituality and resilience and recovery, it's mindfulness, character development, community, accountability, and purpose. And so whether we're a year sober or we've never had anything at all, the importance of resiliency you know, fits in all of it. And how is that defined? It's advancing despite adversity. One of the things that kind of disturbs me sometimes when we talk about this from kind of the secular science-based community when it comes to addiction is we kind of sit there and, and make this statement. Well, relapse is part of it, right? We want to call it reoccurrence now as we talk about it as a long-term illness rather than relapse. But in that space, I'm sitting there going, well, how can I reduce some of that? Because often that relapse, that reoccurrence happens in the face of adversity. It happens without that resilience. So if I'm able to put those five things in place, purpose, accountability, mindfulness, my character development, right? All of those things, if I can put those in place, then perhaps maybe instead of seven times, which is what everybody says about opioid use disorder, maybe it's four, maybe it's one, maybe it's none. Because I've taken in the entire consideration of the bio, the psycho, the social, and the spiritual aspect of this person's journey, both in addiction but now into recovery. And so it says I'm working toward a vision and being proactive. I can tell you straight up, I went to treatment four times. I was in detoxification more than a dozen. I had consequence out the ear. Lost my home. My wife lost her retirement due to my addiction. We had to move in with my parents. I had to stand on the driveway of my house in 2005, I don't remember because my little girl has to tell me this story and they're taking her furniture out of her bedroom. And she asked me, what are they gonna do with my furniture stuff, Dad? And I had to tell her they're taking it to auction to pay off the bankruptcy. Lots of consequence. I had doctor after doctor after doctor walk into my hospital rooms, my treatment rooms, all of that stuff and look at me and say, Greg, if you continue to drink, you're gonna die. And that didn't move the needle. What moved the needle was somebody taking the time, walking in and casting a vision of something else that I could potentially be. And then building a plan around that spiritual component for me to help me walk it out. And that's what we have this wonderful opportunity to do when we encounter folks that are in this space. Is coming alongside and being able to cast that vision. And that vision stands strong in the face of the adversity that we're going to experience. We had a gentleman in Oberlin, Ohio. He had been kind of the town Otis. So those of you who are old like me, you know what the town Otis is. Some of the younger people, you'll have to Google it. But the town Otis. And in Oberlin, Ohio, and this pastor for years had just stepped over this guy over and over and over again. And kind of said, man, why don't you get a job? Figure it out. And then one day the Lord changed the heart of that pastor and his son, and they opened a sober living home, a recovery home in that same community, and now they're serving about 100 folks. It's an amazing ministry. And that guy came into their ministry and came into their facility. And he had been there for a year. And he looked that pastor in the face. He said, do you know why I drank? The pastor goes, I don't know. You're not, not drinking now. Praise God. You're not drinking now. He goes, no, you know why I drank? He goes, I have no idea. And he said, when I was eight years old, I was at a picnic and my uncle and his friends, they raped me. 
And I had no idea what to do with that. And every time I go to a picnic now, it comes back to my mind. And so here we are sitting there, picnics and space and running and playing and jumping and playing horseshoes and all that stuff. What a beautiful picture. But for him, that's his adversity. And yet in his spiritual componentry, what he has been given in his recovery, he's able to go to the park and be able to navigate those things and be able to compartmentalize them where they need to be because he has resilience from his spirituality in his recovery. So what's the juxtaposition from a pastor's perspective? Anxieties come, but they don't stick. Fears surface and they depart. Regrets land on the windshield, but they become wiped off with the wiper of prayer. That juxtaposition of where does spirituality, resilience, where do they come together? It's in the face of those kind of things. That's resilience. Zig Ziglar once said, he said, make failure your teacher, not your undertaker. And so how do I take that adversity and actually use it and flip it on its ear and make it something that actually makes me stronger in that journey that I'm at? We've been surrounded and battered by troubles. We're not demoralized. We're not sure what to do, but we know that God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized. God hasn't left our side. We've been thrown down, but we haven't broken. If we're looking in that moment of adversity and we have this on board of our resilience and our spirituality and our journey of recovery, we can go back to this and say, you know, God said it, he didn't tell you it was going to be unicorns, puppy dogs, rainbows, and cupcakes all the time. You're going to have stuff. But in the stuff, there's the truth. Don't get discouraged. There's the truth. God knows what to do with it. There's the truth. He didn't go anywhere. And so if all of I have is my mindfulness in that space, is that enough to make me resilient? Maybe not, but it is a start to that resilience that I need in the recovery. They're byproducts of unwavering faith as our circumstances don't define us. They refine us. Take the ashes of our past into the diamonds of our future. And so some of the science community, as we have the convergence, as I close, these are some folks who have said, yeah, spirituality makes a difference. Spiritual, spirituality Mind Body Institute, this is Columbia University in conjunction with our friends at Health and Human Services. We do work in the Partnership Center there. They came back and said, with a spiritual core, self is inherent worth. Peace place in the world is a purposeful world. We've heard that word before. Work is a contributing work. It has character, it has integrity, it's working in a different way. It's opportunities in learning. If you think about it this way, Harvard did a study and they said, what are components to human flourishing? And they came down to the number four one was spirituality and religion. And if memory serves right now, I think the chaplain at Harvard might be an atheist, which is interesting to me. But there is the research componentry to say, so if I'm over here and I'm talking to pastors, pastors are like, yeah, amen, that's good. Get over to the science community, yeah, 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 yeah whatever. Uh -uh. You're saying it works too. So don't tell me you don't get it just like they get it. This is a QR code if you want to take your phone and click on it. That's the study on human flourishing from the folks at Harvard. Uh, this deck, I think, is on the Hoover. It'll pop up. There'll be a recording of it, but I'll leave it, leave it there just for a second because I want to wrap up here. I don't, can somebody give me the time? I didn't put my phone down. What is it? Okay. Another great group to go to, and since you got your phone out, this is the Center of Addiction and Faith. This is where I met Keaton. It's a fantastic organization if you're in the recovery space, the addiction space, for very, very broad, very thought-provoking research, conversation, efforts, driven by the Lutheran Church a little bit in Minnesota. Amazing people, amazing folks doing great work up there. A great bastion of education and opportunity there. Good friends, uh, doing some really, really good stuff. That's the QR code for the team that I mentioned from Columbia. If you want to go take a look at it, their, their journey was a little bit more in the space of mental health, but there are quite a few videos, quite a few different pieces of information research. All of that stuff is a part of their thing. So what I wanted to leave you with since we're here in this faith-based context is each one of us can benefit from resilience, but there are moments in time where things get sideways. And when I want to tell you this, back in 2022, and at the end of 21, 22, I got super, super sick. I was crazy sick, and it was my gallbladder. And so I had to have gallbladder surgery, and the gallbladder surgery went horribly wrong. 
and I was in the hospital for a really long time and I was having a bacterial infection and I was coming out of COVID and this is what I love to do. I love to be with you folks and I love to go share what God is doing and, and hope to educate. And I had been sitting in my basement and doing Zoom and I never felt further away from the Father and I never felt more absolutely useless and I had no purpose. And here I am in this hospital and I've got all these IV tubes and I'm super, super sick. And I'm telling God, I'm like, where am I going with this? Where are you at? I thought this is what you wanted me to do. And I'm sad. And Toby Mack writes this song because he lost his kid to overdose. And so I'm sitting in the hospital room. And the nurse comes in to change shifts with me. And the new nurse has got my folder. And she looks at me and she says, are you the Greg Delaney? And she named the ministry that we had started in Xenia, Ohio. And this is when I'm feeling absolutely, completely utterly worthless, kicking around, going back and drinking again. She looks at me and said, are you Greg Delaney from the ministry? And she named the ministry. And I said, yes. And she goes, will you help my mama? And I was like, I got all these tubes in right now. And God brought this song into my life as a song of resilience that even in our darkest time, never forget that God is rolling up his sleeves on your behalf. So I want to thank you all so much for your time and your attention. I left some cards up here for me. Would love to connect to you. Um, I so appreciate um, just having an opportunity to share with you and kind of bring, this is resilience for me. It continues to build my own. Let me pray over you. Father, as the, these folks leave today, uh, Lord, there's so much more they're going to learn, so much more that you're going to encounter with them. And Lord, I pray that what you gave me to share with them was something that they can use, something that maybe... They could apply, but Lord, if all it was was that they heard that last message, that you are with them, that you are working on their behalf, and you're rolling up their sleeves for whatever it is that they're doing, Lord, then we have done exactly what we wanted to do, and that's let them know they're never alone, and that you're always there, and that brings about their resilience in what they do. Lord, watch them over them, guide them, bless them, and it's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. Have a great rest of your time.